So great. If I can first of all um, ask each of the panelists to introduce themselves. Um, um, Flo, would you like to start off with yourself? Yep. Hi, I'm Flo. I'm from Chalk on Chalk, and I'm the Chief Chocolate Lady. And we make um, things in chocolate that uh, look like they are real in real life. So we have chocolate fiber day vegetables and things like that. So you may have seen our products around, um, but we just love chocolate and we love making people smile. Fantastic. Great. And Rosie and John? Hi, um, uh, we're Rosie and John from Eden Treat Collection. Um, we've been with Yumbles for about seven years now, and we work with lots of lovely independent um, producers of vegan and gluten-free um, chocolate, nut butters, um, and other delicious items across the UK to curate hampers, um, which we personalise and send out all over the country. Great, fantastic. And Carolyn? Hi, um, I'm Carolyn. Um, I'm from Mademoiselle Macaron. Um, Rachel, you may hear a baby <laughs> crying in the background. Um, mm -hmm. Rachel, our founder, um, set up Mademoiselle Macaron, um, having learned how to make macarons in Paris. Um, but she's currently off on maternity leave. I say off, she is in the building with small baby. Um, but yeah, we've, we've been on Yumbles a few years now. Um, it's a fantastic platform um, and we're really lucky to, uh, to be selling with you guys. Great, fantastic. Well, welcome to you all. And, and certainly all of you have been on Yumbles for quite some years. We were trying to remember earlier, I know John and Rosie, you mentioned seven years on Yumbles and Flo, I think it's getting on for three to four years. And Karen, I wish I could remember, but it's definitely a good two or three years with Mademoiselle Macaron. So you, you've all not only experienced online, but particularly on the Yumbles marketplace too. So perhaps if we can kind of kick off, um, um, you know, with each of you sharing um, you know, over the years, obviously, your businesses have really evolved, really evolved online. As I said, you've had a few years, each of you selling online now um, and certainly had great success with it. So perhaps if we can um, start by you each sharing what for you is kind of one key kind of fact or lesson that, that you almost wish you had known when you first started out. So, you know, you really feel it's really contributed to your success selling online. Um, again, Flo, do you want to kick off? Sure. Yeah. I mean, we um, started our business 19 years ago, so we we did have a website right at the beginning. And one of the things I do wish I'd um, done was better photography. I know it's something we're going to cover later, but it's really important to get the product across. And I actually went about it more from a kind of trade perspective, like here's a box, here's a picture of my chocolates. And it was very flat. And it was probably only about um, in 2013, probably, that we really suddenly changed everything. And I have to say sales just changed dramatically people kind of felt so much different about the product they could understand the product it wasn't just a sort of flat picture so I think it's really really important um but one other thing I would also say although it was only one lesson <laughs> is, is more delegate. More delegate. <laughs> always delegate and, and ask for help and, and don't feel like you have to have a massive team of people around you to do things you can outsource lots of things and actually that's a much easier way to do it and you're not always stuck with people especially when you're just starting something you don't really want to have loads and loads of people to pay on a payroll and then an HR drama it's actually much better to have lots of people outsource they know what they're doing that's that's why they do that role um mm -hmm. so understand your limitations is definitely one yeah thing. yeah it's so <laughs> hard to do so hard to do when you're starting your business you're trying to do everything control everything so that's really great advice to kind of outsource to specialists and you focus on what you're best at um per perfect thank you and, and john rosie how about yourselves your business obviously has many parts to it but from from your online selling experience what for you is something you kind of wish you'd nailed earlier on or perhaps something you really learned along the way that you wish you'd known earlier I think for us, it's no underestimation to say that um, when you start out a small business, it becomes your everything all day, every day. Um, and I think the advice I would give is make sure that the, the problem you're trying to solve is something that you want solved for yourself. So create something that you would buy for yourself that you would really look to enjoy um, mm -hmm. and be passionate about it. And for us in doing that, we created something which naturally filled a space in the market. Mm -hmm. um, and I think had we not done that, um, we would probably have um, suffered from the lack of sleep by now. Um, and the second thing I think I would agree with Flo, photography made a massive different for, difference for us. About three, four months in, we really invested with a good photographer and our sales changed from there on inwards, really. Yeah, yeah, you certainly both have great photography, um, as, as do you, Carolyn. So, 
And, and you mentioned there around the product range, obviously it's always so fundamental and, and the, the, the old business adage is so easy to forget, but it's actually make sure you're solving a very real problem, fulfilling a very real need and doing it, you know, in obviously in a special, unique way. So, um, so that's, that's interesting to hear that you, you know, really kind of landed on that and, and um, have doubled down. It's very easy to kind of be a, do lots of different things, but you've really kind of honed what yeah. you're filling. Um, and Carolyn, how, how about Mademoiselle Macaron? What, what's kind of a key kind of lesson that you attribute to your success and you kind of wish you'd known perhaps earlier? Um, I think um, sort of from my point of view, um, I think, you know, when I've discussed it with Rachel, it's knowing when to say yes and no to things, knowing that you can make things actually you know achievable when a customer says you know can you make me a thousand macarons in this really specific color to match something it's knowing whether one you can do it um and sort of managing those expectations knowing when to say no to something um i think is is something that you know we're all aware of in business you know you never want to say no you don't you never want to turn it down like you were saying John you know when it is a small business you sort of want to say yes to everything because you don't know when that next order is coming in but knowing when to say yes knowing how to manage those expectations and sort of maintaining the customer service level um, I think is something that we kind of wish we'd known when we started out yeah yeah Great. Okay, perfect. And then photography and um, Flo and um, John Rose, you, you both kind of really herald that as something. And, and so Flo, when you say you, you're a bit trade focused originally, so what you mean by that is kind of the product on a stark white background kind of approach. Yeah. And you've, you've kind of moved to more kind of simple but effective lifestyle approach. Is that right? Yeah, definitely. Yeah. So it was definitely a move towards lifestyle. It was um, adding kind of elements of putting my hand into the picture so that you could kind of get an, uh, you almost somebody else might feel like they were reaching into the picture, but also putting it in a situation where they could imagine using it. I know it's food, but um, when you're having a party, you know, obviously it's the same with macarons and things, you could put them in beautiful displays and not everybody's got our creativity and our sort of visual, you know, we do what we do and a customer just goes, oh, that's lovely, I'll buy that potentially. Um, but if they then see it and they go, oh, I could display it like that and that would look so lovely when we have a baby shower or when we have a birthday party, then people, they, they buy the picture rather than, and then the product is kind of like almost yeah, an afterthought in that sense, because you're just buying the situation, you're buying what you want. And I remember many years ago being inspired by um, Emma Bridgewater's catalogues mm -hmm. and the way she displayed all of her china and you know it was at a trade fair I picked one of those up and I looked and I thought yeah she just makes that look really interesting yeah she does have the the pack shots essentially yeah. but but actually the lifestyle shop makes me want to dress my table like that and put all those plates over it and you know dresses and so on so it was really a learn I learned it from looking at how other people did things in their kind of catalogues and and went from there and just messed around until I got it right um and we did use a photographer initially um but as the phone and, and light and everything has got so much easier to sort of manage yourself I would style them and he would take the photo now I kind of do a lot of that myself I love that part and when you get the shot and you know it's worked then that's kind of amazing you know you're going to sell a lot of that product well yeah yeah oh fantastic we've got Lottie joining us so Lottie from Lottie Shores how are you doing hi I'm so sorry I've been trying to get in but I'm in now so I'm sorry I'm not at all not at all so welcome I'm glad you we've only we've only recently started so um welcome Lottie do you want to just briefly introduce yourself yeah hi so um I'm Lottie Lottie Shores we're craft bakers and we're based in West Yorkshire and we um bake all our lovely treats here and then we do lots of food gifting with um on you know with yourselves at Yumbles. perfect great good so we were just talking about photography and sharing that one of the, the factors that, that everyone here has definitely kind of called out was how photography was quite transformative for them when they kind of nailed it and Flo was just sharing how you know having kind of a more lifestyle looking image so Flo, what you you mentioned um it's definitely something that we recommend you almost want kind of your lead visual your main image to be that kind of more interesting engaging appealing lifestyle shot and then what we always recommend and you touched on it is additional images once they are then having a closer look you want to then show the customer how does it come what format does it come in and give them all the more kind of packaging and different angle shots and that's definitely something that i think all four of you do very well you will have a very attractive kind of lead images and then you have additional images showing them the packaging and everything else they need to know um so so lottie um as a first question to you you know, um, equally, you know, very seasoned and experienced selling online. 
um, and have done very well growing your direct consumer online business. What key factor, you know, or lesson would would do you feel you've really learned that you would love to have known in the early days, you know, of selling online? Yeah, we we found that um, if you have a good selling product, you can always make it into a better selling product. But if you had one that was a poor selling product, then it's very unlikely that that will ever be turned into a good selling product. So, for example, we had our um, Yorkshire bake, our bake treat box, and because that was a good seller, we then added it and made it into like um, a different occasion one. So we added a, a, a maybe put a, we put a birthday option with it, and we put a get well soon one, and we put a thank you because we knew that was a good seller. Therefore, we could accelerate the growth on that. Whereas if the, the poorer ones, we maybe then would take them off and then try something new. Mm-hmm. Yeah, great. So, so kind of product variations, that's something you've been super successful at. And it's something we touched on, um, I think, in the recipe for success webinar that I did the other day was that, you know, you can you almost want to when you're selling online, we strategy is targeting specific occasions. And I know Eden Treats, you're very successful at that as well. Because of course, when people are online, they're either searching, so they're using keywords, very specific needs. Or even if they're browsing, they're going into categories, into areas. And again, they're thinking, what's my need? So, um, so yeah, product variations and targeting particular occasions can be a great strategy. Perfect, great. And then, Caroline, you mentioned customer service there. And the, the one of the biggest challenges business, small businesses particularly face is the saying no, um, um, particularly when you get kind of large, complicated, bespoke requests and things like that. It's very hard to say no to a you know, potentially large order, but, but the complexity maybe sometimes doesn't make it worth it so um each of you when it comes to customer service um what what for you are some kind of principles that you follow i guess how much priority do you place on customer service and what are some important principles that you've learned work well when it comes to helping you know customer service for consumers um obviously but different needs to business customers um carolyn do you want to start yeah, so I would say that um, for me, the the customer service thing is, has been, you know, paramount. It's been particularly paramount in pandemic um, just because, you know, people for people who are shopping from home, um, you know, as we all know, for e-commerce, it, it blossomed massively in, in the pandemic. But at the same time, those people weren't necessarily having any other contact with somebody. So a friendly voice at the end of the phone, um, you know, an appropriate tone in an email and empathizing is the most important thing. And we do set stall on providing the best customer service we can. We went over 5,000 Trustpilot reviews back in March, which we were super proud of. um, And we've maintained a 4.9 star review on there. It's incredibly important because that is the lasting impression that a customer has, whether they've had to contact you with an issue, whether they've contacted you with a question. It's incredibly important that you offer a fantastic experience because that does how someone feels about the product you know you can sell whatever you sell if it's if it's great fantastic but if it's not and the customer service doesn't match up with that it's you know it, you may as well have lost that customer because they won't return you know if they have a good experience they're more likely to return or more likely to recommend you yeah absolutely it, it, it's the not returning it's the noise that can happen publicly and it's also the cost of that interaction right it can go on and on if they're not happy so it's kind of a, a triple whammy if you've got unhappy customers and and Lottie how, how, um, how about from from your experience when it comes to customer service what for you has been some key principles that you've learned along the way so really again just listening to the customer and um, being quick to react to anything that's coming in whether it's a name change or whether it's something you know they've got the wrong address or something like that just as soon as just reacting quickly is key. Um, sometimes I found that um, we are, in my experience of customer handling, um, problematic customers often have other problems um, not related to anything they may have bought with you. So um, an example we had of that was a lady who was complaining that her parcel wasn't received. So we resent it again and resent and and it turned out that it, her ex husband, they were going to her ex husband, and he was getting the parcels, and it was, you know, all very emotional, and there's a lot of emotion in there. So mm. sometimes when there's problems, it, there's underlying issues as to why the people, it, it, might, it might not be they're complaining about your particular product, really. It might be the yeah. best, you know, the straw that broke the camel's back. So, yeah. so it's, um, it's really important to understand the customer. And then, and often we, I would ask a customer how they would like us to resolve the situation. So say if they'd had a problem and maybe the wrong gift 
I'm not saying if the wrong gift did get delivered or something, then then maybe sometimes how how we think they would want it resolving might not be actually how they do want it resolving. So often yeah. I would say, well, actually, you know, how, what would you like us to do? But how, how do you think we could? What's the best way we could sort this? And then it puts it yeah. back to them. So then then they can't say you haven't done the right thing. Yeah. <laughs> so we're often asking them really, is really helpful. Yeah, and that, that's a great technique. Actually, both of you mentioned two really important things there is leading with empathy and, and then, yeah, asking them what they want to solve. We certainly see a lot of that, but often they're just looking to say, like, I'm not happy and this is why, and they want you to, they want to feel heard and they're not always seeking a refund at all and things like that. So I think it's really important to lead with, we're here to help. How can we help you? You know, and empathizing with their dissatisfaction, but just doing that goes such a long way. Um, and quite often, you know, if, if you leave with that response, we've seen time and time again, they're diffused. They're not angry anymore. They feel you're listening. Um, and actually the, the resolution gets a lot easier. Um, great, great tips there. And Flo, John, Rosie, do you have anything you'd like to share on customer service and what you've kind of found works? Yeah, I think for us, one of the things that I think a lot of small businesses fall into is that it's personal because mm -hmm. it's their product. Yeah. And we kind of have three stages to customer service. The first one is to remember it's not personal yeah. um, and that you need to respond in a timely manner, as Charlotte, um, as Lottie said. Um, the second one is to emphasize and put yourself in their shoes. So kind of read it from their perspective and see what they're asking for. Identify and, and give them kind of give them um, validation in their points so they know that they've been heard. And then the last one is show willingness in the same way that Lottie said and understanding and in maybe throwing it back to them again to see how they want to be answered or just providing some variety of solutions which allows them to choose from a menu if that's a better way of doing it for you. Yeah, absolutely. That, that's a great point there. You know, we, we do see we do see that happen sometimes. It's understandable. You're so passionate about your product and your business and particularly for a sole trader and, you know, and someone voices they're not happy with your product and maybe doesn't use the best of language to convey that. It can feel very you know and i we, we always understand it but I, I guess it's first and foremost realizing your business it's not personal your business they're a customer um so that's a great great point there john and flo how about from your side yeah so uh, very similar as well um remove emotions i mean there's been many a night when i've been in the middle of the night crying reading someone's email and it's not i've ruined people's christmas or something and and people just use you know uh, emotional words to to get Get their point across as well when they're also feeling emotional about the parcel or it's missing or the wrong thing that might have been delivered so and also we have uh, we say kill them with kindness um you know the same same principles as everyone else sort of saying really and you know we know that these things go wrong sometimes and a lot of the time it can be a, a postal issue rather than a product issue and i think sometimes reviews unfortunately end up being a postal issue rather than a product issue so we always try and kind of make sure we send their preferred way if, if we're having to do a resend so if actually they just don't like Hermes or every or DPD yes. or whoever it is we'll go to the Royal Mail and post it for them that way so we try and keep everybody appeased and we often put in a little extra chocolate or something and obviously you know, we're all selling food so we're trying to sweeten them up in whatever way we can um, yes. but yeah emotion trying to get the emotion out of it and not take it personally uh, when you're working like crazy it's quite hard yeah. sometimes <laughs> no absolutely absolutely C catch you at 5 p.m on a friday <laughs> um okay perfect great and um we, we touched on a little bit for photography but how about in terms of the the focus and investment and lessons that you've all had in terms of your actual listings your product information and your photography i guess um what you've learned you know what's been your approach to that have you invested a lot of time and energy in considering how you're listing your products what you know what tips and tricks have you had to do with that um Lottie do you want to start yeah sure so I mean really um with the photos we do we do invest a lot of time and um you know and money into that the um really things like don't put things in the photos like props that they sometimes they can't buy because often the customers think they can buy them so mm. I had one this morning saying the bunting is amazing in your jubilee picture you know where can I buy it from the oh, crikey that's not for sale <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> Or, you know, people have put like, if you have a wine glass in with a bottle of wine, you know, sometimes they can buy that as well, that comes with it. So it's been to learn over the years that actually not put things in there that they can't, um, that doesn't come with it. And also to also make the picture not look, just make it realistic. So not make it look like it's jam packed full of product if it isn't, you know, just mm -hmm. make it realistic. So they're not, so you're managing the expectations and they're not yeah. getting something that they think they're not getting. So um, yeah. And then the other thing point I would say is that after an event, 
um, really quickly to, to take things up, to update your store online, because there's nothing worse than going on after Mother's Day and seeing a Mother's Day, you know, um, picture on there. Or if you're looking for Christmas in, in, in March, you know, Christmas is popping up, but something hasn't been taken offline from December and things. So that's quite key. That's my two bits of advice. Yeah, perfect. Great. And, and John and Rosie? I think um, one of the key things is it sounds daft, but making the description um, like that, that headline of what it is as descriptive as possible as to what it is. When we started before we um, we rebranded to Eden Treats, we were Snack Pack and to differentiate between small, medium and large, we had um, the Nibbler Pack, the Muncher Pack and the Feaster Pack. Well, no one's going to know that those those three things equate to small, medium and large. So why not just tell them that that's what they are? Mm-hmm. And then we also looked at we, we did a bit of um, research and actually realised that those, those two at the either end weren't actually selling. So instead we 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 stopped using utilizing our time to further those two products and instead focus on the one in the middle that was selling a lot. And then put all our efforts into making sure that our, our imagery was as beautiful as it could possibly be, making sure that the, the shop was open. Um, uh, and also our listing was as descriptive so that when, if, if a, a, a champagne glass is, is shown, it's clearly listed as to you're not going to get that one. That's that's the image of, of uh, that's an image of what you can do with it. But we're not going to we're not going to ship you the the glass. It doesn't automatically mean that they're going to read that, which is also, which is always difficult. But I think ultimately making making your listing as descriptive as possible and inviting. I, I think put yourself in in their shoes. If if you're a if you're a customer, does that sound appealing to you, or does it sound very corporate and very factual? Um, yes. The balance of both of like this is what you're going to get, but it's, it's it's an exciting element of this is what you're going to get. Um, yeah, so it's it's making it enticing, um, but also critically factual. Otherwise, you will spend your time in customer service saying, "No, I'm terribly sorry, this this isn't included." Um, or and and yes, the, the flavors do vary, etc. Just okay. just touching on the visual side of it as well, a great tip we had from one of our photographers when we were sat in on the shoot was to look at the interior trends that people are doing. So coming into season for Christmas, if the theme is, say, like grey interiors that people are doing for Christmas, they like gifts that fit with their home interior. So when you're shopping, it naturally fits with your house or where you're going. And then, then they're kind of thinking in the same look and feel as what you're buying. So if you shoot your stuff that's on trend with your photography, say your Christmas photography, it naturally gets picked up. Um, oh, interesting yeah good point I've never heard that before that's a great, a great you know pe- people feel like that resonates I I can relate to that that you know connects in a more, more subconscious level perhaps great okay perfect and 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 Carolyn how about you from from a, the actual listings point of view the product information the photos what have been some key points for you um obviously people do eat with their eyes you know they 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 want to buy something that's that's visually appealing um you know, we ha- we we've done macarons that we think are definitely going to be top sellers. You know, flavors that we think they're going to be perfect. Everybody's going to buy them, and then people just don't buy them. And you think, well, why? Why? There's a great macaron. Like it tastes amazing, and it might be that they go for something that looks visually different. I think you know, like like the other guys have said, it's about as much information as possible, about being as transparent as possible. For us, obviously, as well, it's incredibly important. The allergy side of things as well, um, you know, try and make it very clear that the macarons are gluten-free, but obviously, you know, the ingredients are incredibly important to us um, and to myself. The, the irony that I have a nut allergy, so I don't actually eat the macarons, um, is never more apparent than writing out the allergy listings. Um, you know, and, and information is key, really, for customers and for businesses. Yeah, yeah. Customers are definitely much, much more discerning these days. Um, so never mind the compliance issues, but transparency and um, and giving the information is key, definitely. And Flo, how about yourself and when it comes to actual listings themselves? Um, everything that everyone else has said is, is totally applicable. And then things that we do, we'll maybe do crumbs in a picture so you can sort of see the chocolate's been bitten into and there's some bits of it. Just again, just it gives you that kind of imagine that you had just eaten some of it, element of it. Um, but also with them, with the descriptions as well, you know, keeping it, it, all the information needs to be in there. And obviously now we've got to put even more information in with the high sugar and fats and all that that's coming in shortly. Yeah. But I think 
um, you know, everybody knows they're buying a treat on these kind of um, sites. They're not they're not there to sort of be buying necessarily something healthy. There's lots of different options and things to buy. When you're buying chocolate, especially um, for us, you know, we just try and make it as indulgent as possible. And a lot of us have messages on as well. So they're more kind of like geared towards an occasion rather than necessarily something you just sit at home and eat. So um, for us, we just try and make make the photo as appealing as possible um, as, as, we, as best we can. Yeah, absolutely. And so we've actually had a great question related to this. Um, and the question is um, copywriting. Have you used copywriting for your products? And if so, how much difference does it make? So uh, actually, there's two questions. So with the copywriting, has anyone used copywriters before with their product listing descriptions? And have you found it made a difference? No, no. No. So no, no one's used copywriters. You're all doing it in house. And uh, that, oh, carry on, John. I, when I used to work more in the web side of things and worked in kind of user psychology, um, we did use copywriting for a lot of things, especially product related. Mm -hmm. um, so we use a lot of the same methodology. Um, and one of those things was like the inverted pyramid approach, where you you kind of summarise the product very quickly. You answer the you answer any initial questions and give an overview to start with, and then you come down into the the bulk of the detail later on. Mm -hmm. um, and that copywriting approach actually has made a big difference for us because you get a lot of things over to the, to the customer very quickly in terms of what they're looking to answer. Yeah. Um, then they can go down and re-establish any further things that they need to. Um, yeah, so absolutely. Sort of yeah, I, I didn't realize it was called the inverted copywriting approach, but that's definitely something that we recommend. Pyramid, yeah. You start off with kind of the, the hook, what is the product and why should I buy it? Um, elaborate perhaps a little bit more and then you want to get into actually answering questions because it's like the human brain is oh I don't know am I interested oh I'm interested now I've got some questions so um so we definitely recommend that kind of kind of structure kind of the sales piece bit more explanation and then the detailed Q&A um great perfect um good and then I might as well ask the the other question that I can see here is um when it comes to promotions and sales What's your view on them as a business? Would you run sales on low sales times and usually for how long? So can each of you or whoever wants to contribute really say what your approach is when it comes to promotion? So who, who wants to start? I can say something, yeah. <laughs> I think, I mean, a lot of us are obviously all, you know, possibly a little loath to do promotions. So, so you sort of hold back as much as you can. Um, I think if promotions are done little and, you know, there's a little one every so often, but not not frequently. People become to come to expect it. So there's certain companies, I'm sure you will know, it drops on your mat. There's always 20% off. So why would you ever buy it at full price? Um, so you don't, but that's a big company strategy. Um, and they've built that 20% in, whereas a lot of us won't have done that. So when we do it, it's uh it is really for a reason for an occasion, um, something specific. But we found in the last few years we haven't had to do any of that and in fact at one point um we were so busy we weren't, didn't even have time to send emails out to try and bring customers in which we potentially would have offered like a free postage or something but really any promotion that really works is free postage people i think that's the one that people will will fall will go for because it's just that additional element that people don't like paying for so if you can suck it up and, and do a free postage you also know what you're giving away then if you yeah. offer twenty five percent and then someone spends a hundred pounds, you're like, oh god, I just gave away, and you know, then it you don't know what you're going to give away. So if you do your postage and it's always two pounds, for I would say, and you, that's your cost price, you know, every order you're just giving two pounds away, and that's sometimes a, a nicer way to do a promotion and manage it as well. Yeah, yeah, great, great tip there. And, and anyone else, Lottie, what's your kind of approach been to promotions, and what have you found? I mean, it's interesting isn't it? because it, um, at the busy times and we're busy, any, you know, you could argue that you're busy anyway and you've got to, so actually that's probably not the best time to do promotion because you don't want to be discounting when you're busy anyway. Um, mm. But then it's just trying to, how you drive new traffic, isn't it? And it was interesting because when I did, um, when you do promotions, it's like just trying to understand where the traffic's coming, you know, understand more about it, where the traffic's coming from and then how, um, what the, obviously how successful it is and then, the evaluation after it's really important. But I think yeah. I agree a little bit. It's like a lot of us, I don't think, build enough margin in for promotions sometimes. Yeah. So it's a different maybe way of looking at it as thinking actually it's going to be marketing spend against it um, so that you can look and, you know, um, try it and evaluate it. And I guess we, we don't try it. We never know, do we? So there's yeah. key times when, when uh, or there's occasions when you could do more, maybe 
but I think for the peaks, the peaks, you've, you've got to ride the peaks and, and do them. And I think for me, doing the promotions around the peaks doesn't work. It's trying to find the, the other times that, um, that, you know, that when we're not busy to try and drive some traffic and it's when yeah. it works. Yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah, great, great point there also about try, trying and measuring. It's very easy to try things. We have to be clear. How do we actually figure out if that works? Um, and you almost, you always want to figure out how are we going to measure success before we try it? Because yeah. nothing worse than trying an initiative and thinking, how can we tell if it worked? Um, so that, that's definitely a great point there. And Carolyn, Mademoiselle Ma Macaron, do you have any thoughts on promotions? Yeah, I think, um, as you were saying, Flo, you know, we're all now conditioned to almost look at those discounts. Um, and a number of the messages that we get in, uh, you know, how can I get a, a sign up discount? Um, for us, we do have a sign up discount on the website. Um, obviously, it's not through Yumbles. Um, it's, it is it very difficult because I think if you do too many of these promotions, then people are looking for them and they are loath to pay full price. Um, again, I think as Lottie was saying, trying to drive that traffic at those non, you know, non seasonal times is important. You know, we, we know that we've got busy times around, for example, Valentine's Day, Mother's Day, Easter, but it's those quieter times where we could do with that traffic driving to us. So we've, we've done a number of, sort of collaborations, things like Father's Day last year, we were the local business we do so again here so i think it's about sort of being clever about promotion as well um and making sure that like you say katie you know you're you're assessing how you measure what's been successful what hasn't whether it's an influencer campaign um or you know just um a, you know an increase in um emails that are going or instagram posts or stories and reels as we all all know you know whereas it once was just photos that were kind of getting it out there and those lifestyle shots it's now that we've got to be all tiktok stars um you know it's <laughs> it's not working for us here at mademoiselle macron at the moment you don't have to um but at the same time you know it's, it's finding that balance yeah great perfect and rosie john how about your kind of take on promotions and what you've found I think they can, they can be quite tricky because they can devalue a product as well. So if you if you half the price of your product, that becomes the associated value of your product sometimes. Mm -hmm. So our approach would be more probably in line with flows, I think, where you're reducing the barriers to entry. So things like free delivery or if you can do free returns, that's not always ideal with food stuff. But um, things like that, often the consumers already made the psychological decision to make the purchase. So if you can give them that extra incentive because they're already looking at the product by reducing their barriers or uh, reasons as to why they wouldn't buy it, then that, that can actually go further than taking 20%, 30% off your product. Mm -hmm. And it also makes it easier for you to sustain it. Um, the other thing we tend to do is, again, look at the low peaks um, for promotions because at those times we can, in some places, you can improve your position within popularity algorithms. So when you do hit the peaks, your, pop your product's seen as being more popular. Um, and then when you're charging your normal price, you're receiving yes. more sales anyway. Yeah, perfect. Great. Great. So um, I'll just read out another question. I was gonna, um, okay, great. So if anyone else wants to send in some questions, do. So in the meantime, one other um, question, uh, which is a topic that's come up a bit this week in, in Yumble's Live, is obviously that more and more customers are valuing uh, or, or being more values-based, being more conscious consumers, and particularly with the pandemic kind of, one of the values is supporting small businesses, buying from small businesses. So how much um, do you as a business kind of highlight that aspect that you are a small business and kind of lean on that when it comes to promoting yourself online, whether it's social media or what have you? Is that an asset that you like to really kind of tell a lot in your story and do you find it helps? Um, or in, in general, how much is your brand story part of your approach for selling online? Um, perhaps if I start with maybe Flo, do you want to... Yeah, so no, it's, it's a huge part of our story. It's um, it's my dad and I that um, run, started the business together. So it, people people love, I mean, if I put a picture of dad up, I mean, get those lights go flying up. I mean, everybody loves dad. I mean, at the chocolate factory, he is everybody's dad to a team of 30. And whenever we put pictures up of him, people love seeing what he's doing and things like that. So he's very much, you know, a, a selling point, it's dad. Um, <laughs> but he doesn't like doing this kind of thing. So yeah, so let's <laughs> him here. I take pictures and post them online. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it is very important and actually part of our um, product shots especially on our site as well we have 
the, the lifestyle and we have the pack shop. And then we actually have a picture of the factory. Um, it's actually in a nice village outside Bath. So it's not sort of like on a trading estate uh, or anything like that. So we try and, you know, really get that sort of Somerset village feel across as well. And then we also have kind of pictures of some of the ladies in the in the chocolate room as well. So we kind of try and build that into each product. So it's part of it. So you see that story if you're just scrolling through everything, it's the same two pictures that appear on every product, but it's there because we scroll every product, but the customer doesn't. And so it's really important. And then uh, there's a nice video on the website as well, um, which tells everybody about us and what we do. Um, mm. And these are lots of photos. So I think that's really, really important. I think people do buy for that reason as well. I think they like that. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. And, and Lottie, I mean, when, when I think of a business really kind of highlighting their heritage and their story you know, Lottie I, I think you do that in, in particular as well can you comment a bit more on kind of how much of your kind of brand story and your kind of small business and your heritage is something you use and has it been helpful it's really important to us yes I think uh, it's really important to us although sometimes I think we're not very good at we, we need to get better at it because obviously times are always changing and there's different avenues and dimensions and things you can add in there and and one mm. of the things that we're finding is there's so much there's so much competition out there these days and it's really important to get your story across and there's you know um, there's people like um there's, there's companies using robots and things and we've got you know we're real people in a real you know warehouse packing real biscuits and we're baking them and, and so to get the message across that actually we're not we're not mass producing we're craft we're uh, we're scratch baking we're not using premixes you know we're there's so much to get in there but um in terms of sustainability now so we are introducing mm. more products where we can reuse them so we've just done like a little um, it's actually a wash bag but it's a travel treats bag it's got treats in so afterwards it can the gift can be reused mm. um, okay, so in terms of sustainability we look always looking at like our packaging can be recycled and um, we've got cornstarch windows in the in the fudge so they can be recycled so we're doing all these really good things but now we need to tell more people maybe shout about it a little bit more because we, we've always done good we always do what we think is the right thing, but we don't necessarily shout about it enough. Yeah, right. It's good that you said that, that we come across as being very good at that, but um, yeah. at the minute we're going through the court process, and so we're looking you know, at, at that as well. So that's going to be really help us be able to shout about and identify things that we're doing and how we can do things better as well. So so we've got a lot to talk about, and I think I think probably everybody, all of us as um, uh, independent producers, can, can always do better and, and tell our story better because there's always something else we can add <laughs> it's just not yeah. about sometimes to do everything but I don't that's how, that's how I feel I feel yeah, yeah I do a good job but I think we could still do better um, yeah and, and it's certainly you know it's one of the big I mean you, you've all got many assets but it, it's such an important competitive advantage that you have compared to obviously bigger businesses and it's something that customers really value is the small business story and, and the people behind the brand and all of that you know that really is a massive competitive advantage if you can find a good way to bring that to the floor. And Ka Karen at Mademoiselle Macaron, obviously the, the, the name, the brand, the lovely photo of Rachel on a bike. Um, can you tell us a bit more about, um, you know, how much you lean on your brand story and the fact you're an artisan business? Well, it's, it's something that actually we're sort of quite aware of. Um, we're actually about to do um, a bit of a brand rejig. Um, everything's, you know, going to remain the same of how we're doing things and the name's going to remain the same but it'll be a slightly new look um it's been something that's been you know in Rachel's mind for a wee while you know this started off with her at a market stall um in the grass market you know making the odd macaron for friends and then sort of finding that there was this market for it you know so it was Rachel in her kitchen it's now 25 of us here um in the building a lot of our issues is the fact that um, our staff are fantastic, but they're all camera shy, um, you know, and it's it, being able to shout about it. We are, whilst we have so many things that we could shout about, um, the staff as a whole, because we're all working hard, we don't necessarily have the time to do that, but we do lean on the fact that, you know, the recipe that have been developed are based on, you know, French recipes. And when Rachel first started the business, very much you know um french macarons with scottish banter which you know for a lot of people they didn't understand and as e-commerce has driven you know it was very much kind of edinburgh based so there was that sort of tongue-in-cheek scottish approach and um, i would love to see that come back but it's not it doesn't always translate yeah. <laughs> as you would like um so you know it's, it's something that we're aware of and we do try and plug the fact that you know we've got it on our website we have it on yumbles this was you know, it's just grown a little bit now um, and we're really lucky that it has. 
Yeah, yeah, fantastic. And John, Rosie, do you, do you want to add anything to, to that topic? I think um, for us, we're a little bit different in the sense that we, we've been fortunate enough to support lots of other independents in what yeah. we do. Um, and our, our ethos and kind of uh, strategy has always been to give them a platform and a showcase for the really great products they do and bring them together with others that actually match it. Um, and during COVID, we were really fortunate. We had about three or four different companies that came to us afterwards where their distribution channels have been cut off. And they'd said, actually, thanks to you guys, we managed to stay in business because we were so fortunate to receive the trade we did. So for us, that's the rewarding part. And we do try and shout about that because every single one of these independent brands has a really great story. Yeah. And for us, that's what makes it exciting. That's the passionate part for us. And that's what we always did. And that's what we enjoyed. So we brought those products together and put them put them in a box essentially yeah and I think you do make make the, that, that point on both your shop profile and in your product listings too that you're very much kind of curating fantastic independent produce so great okay well I'm, I'm just conscious that we're out of time and I know you're all busy people and I'm sure everyone watching has also got to run off too so that was a fantastic session thank you so much to Lottie Flo, John Rosie and Carolyn um, for sharing your rich experience I could talk to you for hours but I won't I promise so thank you today and thank you for everyone watching, um, whether live or on this recording. I hope you found um, some really great insights in this session for your business. Um, and uh, yeah, wish you a great rest of your day. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks Katie. Thank, thank you. you. Bye. 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 Bye.